good afternoon or late morning for some of you. And thanks for joining us here at Spin Matters and our expert panelists as we present Procurement and Finance Alignment, Destroying Barriers and Unlocking Value. My name is Kendra Cato and I manage client services here at Spin Matters. I'll be running things behind the scenes today. I just checked the attendee list and there are a lot of executive and senior level procurement and finance folks in various industries with us today. And those industries include automotive, aerospace, retail, healthcare, and pharma, as well as a few dozen folks in manufacturing. So you're with an incredible group of peers, and we hope that you aren't shy and that you send any questions you may have. And, and you will remain anonymous, but please do send any questions you have I'd like to pass the mic to Pierre Mitchell, who's our Chief Research Officer here at Azul Partners. He and um, our special guest today, Constantine from Determined, will be also addressing questions at the end of today's presentation. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Pierre. It's great having you here. I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Kendra, and uh, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, we have a uh, Fair amount of content, so I'm going to get pretty quickly to it. Uh, as uh, Kendra said, you guys can get a copy of the slides later, and you can look at all this. Um, but if you're not familiar with us, uh, we run a bunch of uh, websites and associated set of uh, services, advisory services and such, really focused on uh, procurement and supply chain uh, technology and uh, services. And one way to think about this is kind of category managers into the supply market called uh, procurement and supply chain tech and services, and we're here to kind of give you insights around um, techniques, best practices, and the, uh, the tools and providers that can kind of help enable that uh, level of improved performance. So uh, without further ado, let's get into today's topic. So uh, we're talking about finance procurement alignment, and the way and, and the story is pretty simple. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some common goals that finance and procurement have around spend management and around risk management and such. We're going to talk quickly a little bit around what's the problem and where things go wrong, and then we're going to share some uh, I'm going to share some insights around some research that I've done um, with the Institute for Supply Management, really helping to quantify this issue and hearing from procurement practitioners. Um, around the issues that they have um, in terms of this misalignment problem and also some of the, uh, uh, the practices to eradicate some of the barriers that are out there that keep procurement and finance from uh, working together optimally and, and helping the business get the most bang for the buck. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. So uh, the way to set it up is, so if you, you know, certainly procurement is working hard to help the enterprise and to help finance help the enterprise as well. So um, I thought it would actually be good to start with the finance kind of key issues. And uh, there's a great study out there that you can go and download, highly recommend it, from uh, Hackett, uh, the 2017 uh, Finance Key Issues Study. And um, pretty consistent with what you know they've done over the years and in terms of some of the, the trending on this. But you know, so certainly finance, like procurement, wants to be, um, you know, a, a key business partner to the business and really to, to, to drive its own, its own value. So that means formulating strategy with the business and not just executing it. And so for procurement to support that, um, it requires support for things like top line, you know, uh, re revenue, supplier innovation, um, supply planning to make sure that the supply lines are aligned with and the supply base is aligned with um, the, those strategies. The finances objectives around um, analytics, information analytics. So they certainly want to be able to have good pro forma analysis on cost and spend and risk and with cost and spend, you know, to have visibility into profitability. And so, you know, that requires, you know, insights. And this is where procurement can certainly add a lot of value to give a level of visibility beyond just reporting off the general ledger, you know, so this is spend. It's, if you do it well, you can actually break that down into your cost and volume drivers and do that not just for your direct spend, but also for your indirect spend. Um, be able to analyze individual suppliers and your supply base segments and your supply base overall. Do contract analytics, which is especially powerful, and you can tie that in with your spend analytics. So that now you can give finance and the budget owners that view of for this money that is going outside the four walls of your organization, where is it going, who's spending it, how is it trending, what can be impacted, and that is a great um, you know, set of information. And that only is going to be generated unless with, you know, um, 
if you have your house in order around your master data and around, uh, let's say, your P2P processes that are generating a lot of this information. So that's a really key role here for procurement. Um, achieving and man- maintaining an, uh, uh, an enterprise competitive cost structure, that's you know, certainly a two-sided coin, right? So in the sense that this is where procurement can really help on driving down um, you know, spend costs and um, everything on, on the inbound side, you know, a lot of value there. But at the same time, you know, finance does have a very laser-focused view sometimes around um, headcount, and that includes, you know, the back office functions um, and just the functions in general, um, and that includes procurement. So, you know, there's always a relentless focus on efficiency, and this is where, you know, procurement has to work to have, make sure it ha- is um, driving both effectiveness and efficiency because the ROI of procurement, you know, whether whether you're at 2x, 5x, or 10x, is a great use of money, and um, you want to make sure that you're really maxim- that you're maximizing that return on investment, and that means you know um, cutting out just the cost, let's say out of the P2P side, and really reinvesting that into your higher impact, um, you know, sourcing and procurement and, and strategic supplier management um, areas. And then um, you know, uh, second to last, and last, this decision making and being able to have information um, around, let's say, enterprise risk. Um, and just broader strategic kind of uh, metrics, you know, this is where, you know, procurement is really uh, critical to be able to help in things like working capital, how do we make good decisions around cash versus cost, particularly as, you know, interest rates are, you know, looking, uh, you know, as the market's heating up, you know, that has some, some impact on, particularly on small suppliers. And if you're stretching out your DPO uh, in, you know, DPO gone wild um, and it's out at 150 days, you know, it's... um. Uh, there's going to be some issues here around uh, supplier risk. And obviously supplier risk, supplier risk is more than just supplier financial risk, but certainly this is where procurement, you know, has um, a key role to play around helping the business understand the level of risk that's out there and being able to comply against that. So that's all great, right? seems like we should be perfectly aligned, but unfortunately, you know, what, what happens is when finance does focus too hard on hard cost reduction because, let's say, standard costing PPV mindsets around in terms of how they look at, um, you know, how they look at value, uh, you know, that, that can have, that, that has an impact. And particularly if procurement is not just, you know, um, you know, the, the, me- the metrics on procurement itself to drive down, you know, to, to, to drive up, you know, very hard cost savings, but also just the issue of, you know, if procurement is helping to drive a lot of value with the budget owners, and we're creating, you know, this economic value and we're creating savings, but basically all of that economic return is basically passed on to shareholders and none is going to the, to the budget owner, then, you know, that's an issue where procurement is kind of seen as, you know, a lackey of finance and guess what, you know, or you're not getting your phone calls returned because they just see you as a way to reduce their budget. So, you know, obviously this is a issue of making sure that your operating model works effectively so that, you know, procurement's really there driving the value but it's really finance, you know, working with the corporate controllers and the business units to figure out what is an equitable gain share to pass on, you know, to the shareholders versus what's um, kept in place. So that's a key piece around, and we'll talk about the operating model um, in uh, just a second. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this difficulty in uh, getting measurement on some of the broader metrics, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, you know, beyond just um, hard cost savings and certainly around beyond just purchase price um, reductions, but that is a major issue that continues to be a barrier um, for procurement organizations, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a sec. Um, similarly, finance has its own metrics. So, you know, I mentioned working capital. You know, if you're just a slave to your days, you know, to DPO and just, you know, more broadly to working capital at the expense of um, economic value created through, let's say, you know, purchase, dis- you know, early payment discounts where you can earn 35% or whatever the the number is that sets up for you, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big issue. So, um, you know, uh, you have to kind of work with finance to make sure you're kind of uh, hitting, helping them hit their metrics, but at the same time, do it in a way that's um, and balanced, making sure you're sharing with them what is the impact of um, over-optimizing on one, you know, particular metric. Um, next issue is uh, this issue around, you know, procurement just having the organizational permission and the influence and the mandate and, you know, the ability to really affect 
how stakeholders are specking their goods and services and how they're spending their money and you know the process by which you know that they they do that. Um, you know, this procure, finance can play a key role in here. Whether it's getting procurements, you know, uh, on let's say the um, the capex, you know, uh, approval process, um, or whether or just the overall you know process in general. Now you got to be careful around how you set your uh, you know policy limits here because procurement will get overwhelmed if you go too low on you know the thresholds by which procurement is you know must be uh, involved, but. Certainly, uh, finance can be a real key ally here as you continue to tune um, that operating model. Um, one of the issues that uh, you know finance does have, as well as not beyond just kind of the myopic metrics, let's say, on working capital, is just the use it or lose it budgeting process itself, right? So think about that in the spend management context. Make sure to spend all your money so that the next period, the next year, you can you know, spend that same amount of money, whether you actually needed to spend it or not, right? Because right now there's not a good way to take, you know, surplus or if you didn't spend the money and be able to apply some, you know, uh, amount of that to the next period or take it even further, really do zero-based budgeting. And to do zero-based budgeting, you really have to have a really good insight into um, into your cost, um, both internal but also on your external spend. And that's where you know, that kind of spend analysis can be really useful in helping to really, uh, you know, to really apply kind of a, let's say, poor man's, uh, you know, uh, zero-based budgeting approach where you can say, all right, here are my contracts coming up for renewal. You know, here are, um, you know, the, the things that you have in your budget. Let's talk about what can go in, what can go out, what basically to get involved with the budget owners early. And, the single most predictive metric of world-class performance, when I was spent my, some time back in the Hackett Group and doing a lot of benchmarking, the single most predictive metric was really around procurement's early involvement with um, the budget owners and with finance during the planning and budgeting process. <clears throat> so that early involvement is really, you know, key to making sure that you can help them best, you know, spend their money and also gets you aligned with them so that you're not surprised by any last minute deals that kind of, you know, walk into your door where you're uh, needed and you've lost all, all your leverage. So, um, and then also just kind of getting into the cultural uh, awareness around finance and not just speaking their language and understanding their metrics and their me the methodologies and understanding cost accounting and understanding financial accounting. Um, but, you know, really uh, being able to understand that they are going to be off, you know, typically a little more conservative, they're going to be a little more focused, and they're going to have a certain mindset that they're going to use. So you have to kind of start from where they are and then be able to then talk about, okay, well, what does this mean? So say, all right, PPV is great, you know, to be able to apply variances and, and post it to the general ledger, but it doesn't really help you around understanding future looking kind of variances. And so if you think about cost avoidance, you know, there's nowhere in the FASB or nowhere in their training where they understand a term called cost avoidance. And really what it is, it's going to be a future savings. It's going to be a future variance. And to what extent is that actually important? And it is important because that is economic cost. And that's the only cost that really matters because sunk costs are sunk. You've got to be able to look forward. So let's kind of get into, you know, the, the data and really specifically around how can finance and procurement get aligned so we can unlock some of that value for uh, your firm? So in that study, we talked to um, over 230 uh, procurement practitioners, large enterprises, about a quarter of the procurement folks reporting you know, into finance you know, directly, um, some also reporting into shared services. Um, and anyway, we can kind of take a look at the data here. But basically, you know, pretty, pretty broad representation to have a little bit of a, bit of a bias towards more manufacturing. But um, anyway, so that's, uh, we had a nice, nice sample on that. And so um, in that study, the first thing that we asked was, all right, well, what is um, finance's role in influencing procurement? And let's talk about, you know, kind of how they, um, lot, you know, line up. And um, I, what I want to do is kind of uh, over on the right kind of show how this kind of, uh, this influence model, some of the stuff is more mandating, negotiating, but there are other things that are of joint uh, areas of collaboration where finance and procurement can work together. So <clears throat> number one is, 
finance is going to make sure that procurement is driving value. And, and to do that, making sure that you have a good, robust process by which you set savings targets, by which you measure um, savings, by which you book those savings, and also um, all of the things that you need to do around the process itself to make sure it's compliant um, and that it fits within you know, the overall um, you know, fi- finance frameworks and risk frameworks that, that are out there. But, you know, procurement and finance can work together. So it's, you know, how do we help the spend owners? And when I was talking about that piece around, you know, the um, FP&A process, you know, the f- financial p- planning analysis, that is both the dollars as well as, you know, units on the direct material side, which gets into kind of, you know, SNOP and we won't get too much into that. But, um, but it's a dollars piece, but it's also what are you going to use for those dollars? What is the business and what are the spend owners trying to do? And this is really where finance and procurement can really work together to make sure that they're going to have the fund, the investment that they need, and also they're going to make sure that they have the suppliers that they need to um, be able to, and that procurement is going to be available, you know, to help um, them in making sure that they're um, successful. Now, when we get into stuff around setting budgets for the procurement function and also setting targets and cost savings, and, uh, you know, what are the KPIs that procurement's going to get credit for and also setting those targets. This is an area of both negotiation and mandating depending on where you are in your journey. Usually it's a, it's a negotiation. Um, but, you know, this is where it is important to really do this early and do this with data um, rather than arbitrary targets that are, that are set out there. And so the more in which you can kind of get some good rigor, good tools, good metrics, it's going to really help, you know, self feed and um, allow procurement and finance to really, you know, work together. So a lot of great quotable quotes in the study. We'll get, you know, I put them on a little spectrum here around, you know, how does procurement perceive, you know, finance. And so it's all the way from, yep, you know, it's collaborative, the controller's collaborative all the way to, you know, we don't even talk or, um, you know, it's just, it's not in a great situation. But one of the things that was pretty interesting is that procurement was pretty, you know, procurement folks in general are pretty fact-based and, you know, about how they themselves perform. And um, and I think it was it was just kind of, you know, interesting where um, one uh, procurement executive had this great quote, you know, gosh, you know, finance has got the, that top management relationship and is seen as an asset where we're like the evil stepchild that, you know, everyone hides from and wishes they could disappear, which is actually funny because that whole spend management system actually, you know, is pegs back to, to finance. But, um, but, but this is, you know, there, there is a key point where finance and internal audit can really be useful. You know, it is good to have the sticks as well as the carrots to be able to help be the enforcer and to get good, you know, compliance. But obviously, you know, you can't, there's only so much mandate you can, uh, you know, you can use. But, you know, that's really why you got to collaborate with, with, with finance. Um, but when the groups work well together, I really loved this quote. It was a really nice, cogent kind of, you know, way of explaining how the groups work together, which is, hey, you know what? With spend management overall, not just, you know, uh, supplier spend, that controls investment and the priorities and the basis for profitability. And so that partner, AK Finance, if it's equipped with a clear understanding and the value of how we deal with, say, non-core processes and also, you know, core processes, which most companies have a really strong handle on, but particularly on the indirect side. But this ability to really manage that part of, you know, uh, spend management, you know, and uh, procurement, particularly around the indirect, to its fullest extent, that's going to really not only drive out costs, but free you up to to be more market responsive, to, to lower your risk, and to really help the, uh, you know, the supply chain owners and the budget owners be more, you know, successful in what they're trying to do. So um, the argument for finance leading SPED management with, with procurement having its role uh, in terms of source to pay and, you know, um, supplier spend, you know, management is, um, you know, it, it, finance is key, right, because you have that senior management influence. You can control budgets. There's the working capital piece. They have that single source of truth, and it's really not just the general ledger, but really what most progressive finance organizations really like having is having that system of record extended to 
particularly contracts as the ultimate commercial system of record and tying those contracts you know, into um, both the sourcing process and into our ongoing execution as, and as also into our financial reporting side and understanding our liabilities, our obligations, and, and all that. So, um, you know, money controls the decisions, and uh, if you can get finance support, you can implement those those changes. So nice quotable quote. I like the other one. Finance are like police. <laughs> I like the police. Um, all right, so let's get to this issue now around, um, you know, it made me think of Jerry Maguire, which was, you know, there's Tom Cruise saying, help me, help me, help me help you, right? So here we have procurement uh, talking to finance about how can, and the rest of this, you know, webcast, we're going to talk about how can procurement tell finance, how finance can help procurement. And by doing that, procurement's going to be able to really help finance accomplish its objectives as well. Now, finance, yeah, they're saying, show me the money, right? They want hard cost savings. They want clear line of sight. Uh, they, want predict- uh, they want predictability. You know, they want risk mitigation. So got to be able to, you got to show them the money. And, but at the same time, if you want to show more money because there's only so many, you know, cost savings that are going to be out there and, you know, certainly, you know, purchase price variance, you know, base savings, you're going to have to go a little broader. And if you're going to go a little broader, you need some more tools, you need some more resources, you need some more, permit, you know, organizational permission. So to do that um, really requires some, um, honestly, some, some education and just some collaboration and discussion around where are the areas where finance it may be unknowingly, um, you know, uh, destroying economic value by tying procurement's hands um, in, in certain areas. And those four areas, if you had to kind of look at what we found from the study, kind of boiled down to four things. So one was this mindset change from efficiency to effectiveness. Uh, two, how do we tune this overall operating model for supply management, spend management, ultimately integrated business planning and management, if your company is a little more sophisticated there. Uh, how do we tune that operating model to make sure that procurement just plugs seamlessly in into FP&A, into the sales and operations planning, into risk management, and into, in, into contracting, and, and into our, um, you know, into working capital management, and into our source to pay and into our P2P process and that overlap and connection point with payables. Um, so that's number two. Number three, how do we really do spend in supply management, you know, kind of best practices to extract maximum value from that spend? So we'll talk a little bit about the process there. And then four, how do we protect the business? How do we keep the supply lines flowing? How do we protect the brand, you know, et cetera? But really, it was kind of in this order. So I won't, we're not going to read through all these line items, but um, these are basically like the average um, ranks. So um, a lower number is better. And what I did is kind of grouped these procurement recommendations to finance of where finance can help procurement unlock economic value and basically, you know, grouped those and sorted those. So now we're, so let's kind of get into a little bit on. Uh, going through that, and then we'll uh, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so the first so the first thing is kind of this efficiency to effectiveness. So um, you know procurement ROI, which is annual you know uh, validatable um, spend savings, and let's just say hard economic value that is that is you know uh, realized um, or expected to be realized with a high degree of you know con- of, of precision and, and, and control. Um, you know, what are those savings, you know, divided by the cost of running our supply management, spend management processes, a.k.a., you know, the procurement um, function and, and other folks that are, you know, doing this as well. Um, the, uh, you know, procurement has a fairly high ROI. Like our numbers in this study came out a bit higher than what you see out there in the traditional, you know, some of the benchmarks from, uh, you know, Carney and then the consultants and, and Hackett and Caps and et cetera. But, Regardless, whether it's 5x or 10x, it's it's a big nut. So making sure that procurement is viewed um, as a profit center of sorts to make sure that you know any just it's not just about reducing cost and just around efficiency, but that is 
incremental investment that generates 5x ROI, which is certainly exceeds the hurdle rates that, uh, let's just say, most organizations have. So to do that, you have to break down the barriers. And how do you treat procurement as a true par- a partner and, 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 quote, profit center, even if it's not a real profit center, rather than just cost center mentality? So that also means kind of how do you, um, particularly around, let's say, in P2P, not just, hey, you have this thing as an extension of AP and just say, hey, it's all around transactions, because particularly around transactional purchasing, there's a linchpin that is right back to sourcing and back to contracting. So, you know, P2P actually starts with this, oh, I have a need, and then from there, great, if we already have a bunch of suppliers and, 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 and catalogs and smart forms and all that stuff set up to guide the buyer down the right P2P path, terrific. For everything else, it needs to feed back into the sourcing process very efficiently and effectively so that we can go and then drive those, you know, lar- that larger economic value that gives us the 5X or 10X. And in doing that, we have to move beyond this PPV, you know, kind of mindset. And so we also, in this study, we actually had um, uh, folks say, all right, let's talk about the level of credit, if you will, that you get in terms of what's on procurement's, you know, scorecard um, around these different sets of value that procurement creates. You know, both hard cost, you know, savings. So we kind of gave it four buckets, you know, so there's a... Um, so there's hard credit, in other words, like, you know, you get credit and actually your bonus is tied against this. You get some credit where, yeah, it's somewhere kind of on the scorecard, but you, you're not necessarily getting bonus on it. There's no credit at all, even though you still might be doing it, um, or have some behind-the-scenes kind of metric, or there's just no credit and you're not even tracking it. And the thing that's interesting is that is if you move from top to bottom, um, from kind of most... Um, most straightforward things that are measured around, let's say, negotiated savings, where you're basically saying at, you know, projected volumes, current slash projected volumes, you know, previous price, future price, as well as maybe some non-price, you know, cost elements that, you know, total um, landed cost um, that you can actually track and have good visibility. So that's, you know, that, that's certainly fairly high up there. As you start kind of going down to say, well, I have no baseline and I want to go against just an initial, you know, bid or an average bid, it starts to drop off a little bit. You start saying, you know what, I want to look beyond one year and I know it's convenient for finance to close the books and just apply variances and use that, but let's actually align our savings to that commercial vehicle called the contract and if that's a two or three year contract, let's make sure that as those savings are realized and are, are there accru- and are accrued during the duration of the contract, let's make sure that in those years we are um, recognizing that value creation. When you start asking that, it gets a little bit less. Now let's look at early payment discounts. Early payment discounts, you know, is a hard it, it is a hard saving. Now you may trade it off versus something else that are on the cost of capital and net that out. But, you know, it is a hard thing. But yet, that quite often drops off on the scorecard. Then when you go to, say, capital costs, and we say, all right, let's look at, you know, what are the capital cost reductions that we can get by procurement, say, working with suppliers to do a vendor management inventory program, et cetera, drops off even further. Okay, now this, you would think, would be a no-brainer. Hey, anything that contributes to enterprise value, EVA, any of those enterprise-level metrics, Right, I should get credit for that. Unfortunately, quite often uh, procurement uh, finance does not really have a strong EVA metric that it's using, or it's not operationalizing it by driving down into the business. Right, so that is um, that is an area where finance could be more take more of a leadership role in using those um, valuation frameworks and also operationalizing them, and at least procurement being able to help operationalize it in the supplier spending piece of the equation, um, you know, and and try to drive some some value there. Now we get into avoidance, right? And so we get into, all right, let's look at long-term agreements, maybe some basic, you know, which is a hedge in its own right, but, you know, look at hedging, et cetera, drops off even more. Now let's look at the stuff that's truly strategic. Increase our revenues, right? Um, We'll skip the headcount reduction piece, you know, um, the reduce supply risk and noncompliance. How do we do demand reduction, consumption reduction, and to reduce overall spend 
you know, and to what extent, you know, that's a classic best practice, right, in terms of how do we do that, energy management programs, all that kind of stuff. But do you get credit for it? Quite often the answer is no. So there's all these things that can create economic value, and the important thing is um, making sure that someone in the organization is driving those value streams. And for procurement um, to ask finance and say, look, do you want us to do these things that are strategic? And if so, we need to get credit for more than just the one or two value streams that are up, you know, up top or wherever. So if you want us to do this, we want to do it. Let's just figure out a way in which we can do it, set up a system together to make sure that that does dawn. And it's not necessarily by folks reporting up into corporate procurement itself. You can be doing it with folks in the business. can be finance resources. doesn't matter. The most important thing is, you know, to make sure that that's, you know, um, you know, that that's getting done. Now, there are some pieces around who gets the credit for it. Do we double count the benefits? There's, 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 there's some kind of plumbing involved in some of this. We, we don't have the time to get too much into it, but certainly um, if, if you have some questions, we can hit that in Q&A or, 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 or later as a follow-up. Um, so next is about this area on the operating model. So for the operating model, we're really talking about, you know, how do we get procurement involved in not just planning and budgeting, but in M&A activity, right? And so in some, you know, pre-merger assessments and also some post-merger integration work, um, getting involved around joint ventures, doing supplier innovation work, and then figuring out how do we best um, manage the IP around that, you know, contractually. How do we set up, you know, the best, the best ways to deal with that? Can be tax efficiency issues within the global supply chain. Can be variableization efforts to reduce, you know, your capital cost footprint. Lots of ways in which procurement can plug in across the board on kind of that EVA decomposition, that DuPont analysis, whatever, you know, you use. So, you know, really getting involved in these strategic um, initiatives as well that really procurement needs um, to be there, as well as now with digital, digital business strategy. You know, with all the innovations that are happening in the supply market, procurement better be at the table talking about, you know, what it has seen in these various spend categories and how innovation is creating disruption there and how that might actually affect what you as a business are doing and how you um, are serving, you know, your customers. So this is where, um, you know, procurement has to work with finance to make sure that procurement is getting baked in appropriately into planning and budgeting, but also that you're doing things like, you know, working with internal audit and with the controllers as change agents to really help procurement, particularly when you're finding noncompliance, you know, on the policy side and, you know, using, using them as a bit of the heavy, if you will. In fact, I've seen some clients actually uh, bake into their internal audit process some of the best practices around managing your spend so that, you know, if you are getting noncompliance, that becomes a material finding that internal audit views as a material finding that has to be addressed, and that will get a lot of, uh, of attention. So take your, take your internal auditors to lunch and, uh, um, you know, work with them as, as, as partners. So uh, let's talk a little bit on the operating model here, too, around the, the economics of improving your operating model. So one of the questions we asked here is, um, not just this, you know, issue of where is procurement, you know, involved, but based on that, we also asked a savings, um, some, uh, savings question. So we said, so yeah, it's a thumb in the air, about right across 200 plus companies. You get a, you get the story that emerges from this, right, in terms of what are the sourcing savings, and I just, you know, made it just for indirect because it's a little more comparable here. Um, and, you know, based on your influence model in terms of when procurement is involved. So when procurement's involved at late stage negotiations, you get some value, so 11, 11% here. I think all these numbers may be a touch high, but, you know, you know at, at, at the deal level, but that, that's fine. Um, you know, it depends. It doesn't matter. What's more important is kind of saying when procurement is involved earlier at supplier discovery, goes up to 13%. And when it's involved at requirements definition, it's 17%. And you can take it even a little further and say when you're actually involved at planning and budgeting where you're actually looking at how much overall dollars is, you know, the business unit or the, the uh, 
the partner function, but that you know that's when you're going to have that maximum kind of set of things that you can do. So in other words, make versus buy decision, all these you know ty- types of things that you can get in, in, involved. And there, you know, many organiz- some procurement organizations are involved in that kind of uh, uh, make versus buy and kind of you know outsourcing decisions and kind of getting involved there. So um, you know that that's key. By the way, we actually asked a question on the stick the thing we we're talking about the, uh, the the stick, not just the carrots. Um, but you know that stick needs to be bigger. We actually asked, you know, if procurement is bypassed when a deal is signed, what is the penalty that's out there? And quite and what you find here is that there's a quite a bit of folks that you know there's no penalty at all, um, and that's either because there's no policy even existence or it's just been difficult to communicate it. It's a minimal penalty because procurement doesn't have a stick. And, you know, and sometimes finance even doesn't have the stick. That's, you know, only for, you know, uh, some segment. Um, uh, you know, others, yeah, there's a warning, and then it escalates, but it's a bit informal. And then, you know, as you get to, you, to the last, then you get into a little bit of the more where there's, there's teeth. Where, yeah, there's a warning, but then it escalates, and eventually, you know, there could be some impacts on your budget, or you could, you know, people could actually get fired, um, you know, and then also, you know, no payment being authorized to this fire. So no, no, so for example, on the the policy around, um, you know, no PO, no pay, you know, it can be a bit draconian. It's a way to do it. We're, we're not um, big fans of that policy just in its own right. Um, it, it is a key tool, but um, it should be done in the context of a broader uh, P2P um Process design and transactional channel design as to how you're gonna you're gonna manage that. So um, we asked a question on you know how did you use finance here to help in spend enforcement and what you have are some great quotable quotes and we always like to put lots of quotable quotes out there so that you can you know use them in your own you know presentations but really get kind of you know the voice of what your peers um, you know are saying and uh, you know. You can you can see the different ways in which finance is being used. So let's talk quickly on the FP&A side um, in terms of the the planning and budgeting process. You know what you find is that yeah, it's an annual process typically. Got rolling quarterly forecasts. Sometimes it's annual, but you know you have this process. But really, in terms of the practices, it's not so great in terms of. Can you track real-time budget consumption using a good technology system, right? And so when there's during requisitioning, you want to do the budget check. Um, you know, the fact that it's a use it or lose it process and then, you know, very few people are doing zero-based budgeting or even some proxy um, of it. Um, and, and not that many people are really, you know, just helping the business plan the overall expenditures, um, and getting ahead of the spend, namely around, you know, uh, at a minimum looking at the uh, the contracts that are coming up for uh, renewal and <clears throat> renegotiation. So, you know, this is where if you're going to get involved during planning and budgeting, these are the things that you, you know, really should be doing. And if you're going to be doing these things, you better bring some good information to the table, both intelligence, you know, around the markets, but also just basic information about spend and contracts and making sure that it's accurate and that it ties, you know, generally the financials and you might even say down to the, you know, down to the penny or very, very close and being able to identify when the numbers don't tie exactly and be able to explain that because that'll be one of the big things that will um, derail you. So if you have the information, um, that's like table stakes to the game, right? And it, you're going to be able to add a lot of value just from the get-go. And then once you do that, then you can kind of get into, let's talk about market pricing, let's talk, look at our category strategies, let's talk about outsourcing options, uh, potentially, you know, we can look at some of the contract, we can look at some of the compliance issues, and it is important because a lot of times the executives, you know, over in the business don't necessarily realize what's happening in the trenches and the level of non-compliance that is out there. So unless you have a really detailed system that's giving you that visibility, it's hard to give them, them the data. So um, in terms of breaking down the barriers, one of the biggest things here, too, is, is that by doing spend analysis and doing good strategic sourcing, you're going to start to get, um, uh, you're going to start to unpack the issues around costs and volumes. And as you get into cost modeling and as you get into savings 
tracking, you're going to get into this issue around cost management. And this is the number one issue that procurement has with finance is really finance taking a cost management approach and really being a leader and helping to look at cost modeling you know, and how we do total cost modeling, particularly on the CapEx side, and really work with a partner here. It shouldn't be a procurement ha- is having to kind of take, try to take the leadership role around cost management. Really, finance should have a leadership role to kind of work with procurement um, and, and help lead that uh, particular um, area. Obviously, we're, as we've been talking about, you know, this piece around spend and savings visibility, and if you look at that statement and how it manifests it and you ask the question, can you confidently track and tie our spending and our savings to the financial statements, you find that only about that 56% agree or strongly agree. So that means about a little less than half do not have that tying to the financials. And that is not in a good place to be, and it's not where you want to be, and it's not where finance you know, wants to be, honestly. So um, that is one of the big selling points, making sure that you get, you get on the same page around having that level of visibility. Now, what's, you know, all, what you also find is that you know, there is an issue here about being under-resourced, not having the people, not having the tools to provide that level of visibility. And what we found in the study is that when, I don't, I don't think I have it in here, but there was definitely a correlation around resourcing you know, and being able to get that level of visibility. And you might not be able to track all of these things in terms of what that um, year-on-year process looks like. You know, you might not be able to break out the negotiated price savings versus volume effects versus compliance effects versus did we change the spec versus what's going on around market pricing um, and also currency effects. Maybe you can't get all of those, but, you know, the more in which you can at least start to, in your spend categories, understand which of these are really key and be able to kind of just use your overall spend numbers and be able to track within your cost centers what percentage of that is going to the suppliers and to what contracts and how is that going to change the following year, at least starting there, then you can kind of then unpack into demand drivers, currency effects, you know, thing, things like that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of opportunity to improve there on the granularity um, there. Um, one of the questions that I, I just, I, I really wanted to get some data on, which was, what is the issue of this? What is the economic impact of the lose, use it or lose it budgeting process? So, you know, we asked the question, all right, what percentage of your indirect spend is sourced kind of in the last few weeks of your fiscal period, a.k.a., you know, your techn- a lot of your software deals and et cetera? And what percentage of these in a period deals actually come from use it or lose it? And so we, because, um, you know, if you don't spend all the money, and, hey, as one of many providers out there in our business, you know, we get folks who are saying, hey, yeah, we got some money that we need to use up, and we'll happily, happily take the money, but if you think about, you know, should that money even be, be spent in the first place or shouldn't it be able to be rolled over and applied to a future period? Yeah, it, it should. And that is an area where there's, you know, some, you know, kind of it's a finance issue that ultimately, a policy that ultimately affects the process by which you, you know, can drive savings. And it has an issue on procurement because you have this big hockey stick effect where you get all this last minute, you know, the, 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 the end of the quarter and the end of the year activity where you're just scrambling like, you know, as much as the sales folks are scrambling on your suppliers, you're scrambling just as much to do those, to do those deals um, with them. And then finally, risk management. Don't need to talk too much about this, but obviously there's a lot of risks out there, a lot of risk types. Uh, finance, you know, and your risk management group is going to have different lenses on this, but you'll need to work with them on how you extend that risk management thoughtfully out to the supply base to make sure that they're both uh, in compliance and in regulatory compliance and that you're also getting the insights that you need to not just check the box on compliance, but also really see where there's potential risks that are going to uh, impact your supply chain. So um, in terms of just to summarize and the recommendations, so increasing finance alignment, procurement alignment is really going to help, you know, the procurement service delivery. And, and, and obviously you don't have to use the word service, you know, as procurement as a strategic partner to finance and to the business working together with finance to improve overall 
spend management, supply management, supply chain management, risk management, working capital management, all those things, um, you know, CapEx management, all those things that you're trying to drive at the enterprise level, procurement should be really fitting in hand in glove within, with finance to make that process better, both around on the performance management side, um, what KPIs, how we set targets, on the capability side, which is, you know, the analytics and what you're doing to actually give you and finance the tools you need to help the business make good decisions when we get back to that original, that first slide, and to the value that, um, that you can create, and to also, you know, to document that and make sure you have, you know, savings tracking and all that, and all that, uh, and all that stuff. So it, that's absolutely going to be um, key. Um, finance should not, should be asking you, you know, what they can do to help you, but if they're not, engage them, right, and use some of the information from this study to have a discussion, let's say, around those value streams or, um, you know, around your operating model and to, you know, look at some of this data. And if there's other data that we didn't share here and that you're, that you're interested in, you know, put that in the, question, in the Q&A and we can capture that um, as well. But, you know, this is really where you have to fill that leadership void, let's say, on the cost management side um, and really kind of pro- proactively, you know, engage them because quite often they might not even realize how much your hands are tied by the performance measurement system and by the policies and um, and by the resource issues and et cetera. So you have to shine the light um, on that. So, and if you can do it right, then, you know, really enterprise, you know, FP&A and, you know, that enterprise spend management and, and, and finance in terms of just how you manage your money as a business um, should link and dovetail very seamlessly into supply management and, and, in, procure, and in procurement. So um, I'd like you to think about some questions here um, in terms of what you might want to get here in, in, in the Q&A. And as you do that, um, I'm going to turn you over uh, to uh, Constantine, and he's going to tell you um, a little bit about uh, Determine, and I'd like to thank them as being a, a sponsor for uh, today's event. And so, uh, Constantine, take it away, and then we'll get to, uh, to, to Q&A. Pierre, uh, thank you so much for uh, a very informative and, and detailed discussion around uh, a topic that many of those on the call, I'm sure, uh, were very interested in and, and, and have learned quite a bit. Um, and in, in, in context of this, you know, we like to sponsor events um, such as these because we really feel it ties back to what we're trying to do as a business and really empowering decisions for, for procurement, for finance, and for the wider enterprise and what we do as a business uh, from a technology standpoint. So, um, so as a company, we like to do this. And what we really uh, find is, is that by aligning these processes and by getting uh, disparate parts of the organization to talk better, you're improving the collaboration, you're improving efficiencies, and you're getting those results that you're looking for. And, you know, the way we're doing this today with our, with our customers is truly um, by delivering something that we're calling uh, platformance. So being able to engage uh, our customers on a platform by being able to really integrate and touch some of these, these challenges uh, of being able to move process, be able to integrate and provide that visibility so that the procurement and finance organizations can do a better job of improving things like understanding budgeting requirements as well as getting better insights into the audits uh, and the internal audits that are happening within the organization for improving those processes. So um, I'd like to thank again um, Pierre for doing an excellent job and, and helping validate a lot of the things that we are, are, are promoting and, and, and touching on when we talk to our clients about technology. And I think now we can just probably turn it over to a few questions here uh, at the end of the session. So Kendra and Pierre, thanks. Thanks so much, Constantine. I appreciate you joining us for the Q&A today because we have gotten some excellent questions that have already come through. And we encourage everyone, once again, to take advantage of uh, this time with with Pierre and Constantine and with all of your peers and send your questions on through. Um, To start, uh, I'd like to direct this one to Constantine to start, if you don't mind, Pierre. Uh, This came in from our listener, Greg, who asked, how does organizational reporting structure influence the relationship? Ooh, that's a that's a that's a, that's a tough question. I um I feel that you know 
the uh, the structure itself is is really determined on the culture, I, I think, of the organization, and it really depends on what the the mo or the modus operandi of, of procurement is intending to be. So, and back to some of the things that Pierre was saying is how that relationship has been set up, whether it's a shared service or whether it's uh, you know, you know, um, centralized, decentralized uh, type models. I think that has a huge impact on uh, how the the organizational structure will impact the relationship. Let alone the processes that you're trying to put in place and that you're trying to digitize or even automate uh, to get those two organizations together. Maybe Pierre, you could you could also provide your your insight on that one too. Yeah, no, it's a great question. That's probably one of the most frequently question, asked questions I got when. Um uh, in, in a previous life and uh, on the, kind of the benchmarking performance measurement side and, you know, how, did, how does performance change? Um, what I will say is that, you know, the actual structure itself doesn't really matter that much because it it's a dual-edged sword, right? So when procurement reports, let's say, into finance, what will become apparent is really the quality of the finance organization and how sophisticated it is. Procurement reports into finance, and finance is very myopic, very old school. You're going to have an issue, and what's going to happen is, um, honestly, you'll probably get um, uh, the best procurement people are, are going to leave. They're not going to stay at that organization, and they're not going to you know, view it as worth the investment to kind of work with finance as a partner. For um, when finance is more sophisticated, you know, um, and you can work with them and then collaborative uh, to kind of evolve the model, then that's where you know, it, it can actually be very beneficial because finance does bring the stick. Procurement does not really bring any stick, um, and, and, and it has no real mandate really um, on its own right and has to kind of, you know, work closely there. So it's less so much the organizational structure, more around the practices that you have around good governance and alignment and, um, you know, all, and visibility and just all the practices and, all, and, and technology and all that stuff. But if you are going to report into finance, it's really going to depend on the quality of the, the finance organization and really the extent that you can influence them. And um, the questions are definitely rolling in. So um, for folks who can hang on and stay with us for a few minutes after the hour, that that'll be fantastic. We'll do our best to get through all of these. And um, the next one was, what is the best practice for ensuring savings can go to the bottom line in a way finance believes? Should this involve incentives for the business to responsibly invest? to fight against the use it or lose it mentality. Sure. Yeah, I guess on this one, I'll start and then Constantine, you can jump in. Um, I think the biggest thing is, first of all, you have to have, um, you got to unpack this issue a bit. So there's one around just use it or lose it. Let's just kind of accept that that's going to be the model, right? And we're not going to do a zero-based budgeting kind of approach. And even with use it or lose it, um, having the spend analysis and you, not just your historical spent analysis, but your spend planning in terms of when you bring in your contract information and the renewals, you can kind of look at, all right, you know, here's what the overall dollars need to be in the, in the cost center, and also here are the contracts coming up for renewal, and here's what spend should be. Just having that can be very useful in the discussion, you know, with, with the business units. The bigger issue is kind of more of the, is that operating model issue of, um, uh, who, how the actual value that's getting created gets kind of calculated and measured, and then more importantly, how is that then recognized in terms of is it passed back to the budget owner or does it, is it given you know, just to the shareholders? That is something that procurement needs to stay away from, you know, like, uh, like fire, um, and to make sh- but to also make sure that there is an effective process by which the divisional controllers or um, however you're set up are, are, are working with the business to say, oh, given that there was a, um, a lot of value that's created, not just through procurement, but through Lean and Six Sigma or any place where value is created, that there's an effective process to kind of say, here's how much we can pass on, here's how much we can kind of reinvest in the business. You know, that is something that, you know, finance has to really – uh, drive a lot. Uh, drive a lot of the bigger issue is more around how do you real, you know, kind of measure the savings um, and and how do you actually like measure the accrual of those savings? And basically, there's kind of you know two ways. And what most companies do practically is to say, look, we are renegotiating a bunch of contracts. They're going to have a certain duration. We're going to recog- that's going to happen at a certain point. We're going to recognize a certain level of those 
savings. But basically, you're going to say the amount that we're going to reduce those budgets after you do some negotiation. And you want to make sure here that everything is above board with the stakeholders, you know, so that it's not like they're not just viewing you as a lackey of procurement and that, you know, any value you create is going to be just there to, you know, make you hit your your procurement goals and also come out of their budgets, in which case, you know, why are they not calling you back when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to engage them? But the biggest thing is really um, the way most companies do it is to say, these are really the savings that we're going to expect to get, you know, to, you know, to, um, you know, to, to, to get booked. And you actually go ahead and reduce the budgets, et cetera. The thing you have to have to make sure is that you also have the ability to monitor um, your spend compliance. And what that means is look at the spend that you have in a category or sub category or individual commodity and where you have an approved vendor list associated with that category and a contract associated with that and make sure that the spend is in fact going to the preferred supplier within that and preferred suppliers within that category to make sure it's compliant. And if it's not compliant, that that is being identified because that if, you know, if, because if, if you're getting non-compliance, all those savings you could negotiated are basically meaningless, and all you're doing is forced demand management. You're just taking money out of the budgets um, without actually driving economic value. And how finance can do that just by, you know, just reducing the budgets. You don't need procurement there. So I think that's the other piece is you have to have that measurement system, um, particularly around the contract compliance, and be able to monitor that. And you can't monitor that unless you have spend classification at a um, at the level of detail in which you have preferred vendor list and also have that contract detail mapped against that. So, um, Constantine, you, you're, you know, you're familiar with, you know, yeah. on, on the tech side, if you want to chime in on that. Sure. Yeah, so I, I think just carrying that forward is not only is the category and the spend, but having the visibility throughout the process whenever you, once you've established that budget, and being able to take that all the way through on an ongoing basis. A lot of times when we're dealing with our customers, you know, they're looking for whether it's a, cop -ex, a CapEx project or an OpEx or just special projects for services. One of the areas that we're really finding that people are, are getting that, uh, you know, use it or lose it uh, ability to say, hey, look, we really know what our budgets are is because they have that visibility throughout the process tied to that contract like what Pierre is saying and being able to see exactly what's going on through that process and having the ability to, to adjust and uh, also reconcile and, and manage against that budget in a real-time way, not just assuming that, you know, it's a one and done and then looking at the end of the year and saying, oh, yeah, we are over or under, and now what do we do because we didn't achieve those savings. And I think that's, that's a real important part of that process uh, in terms of what we've experienced. Right. That's great, concept. Thanks. Um, God, we got some questions. We're trying to pick pick amongst them. Um, I'll, I'll I'll pick one that I thought was good, which was, um, how does procurement best position this new relationship with finance as a benefit to the business to avoid poisoning one relationship at, by expanding um, the other? Yeah, it is. You got to um, obviously got to tread carefully and assess what that relationship is between all the entities involved. What I would say is that the more in which you can bring. Be, be the uh, harbinger of changes where you can bring new capabilities to bear like spend analysis and be able to not just give that to the business. So say, hey, you know, here's your spend cubes, here's your contracts, you can go have at it and understand what's going on with your own spend. And, you know, you, get, you do that and people, they want to, you know, they generally want to know where their money is. And it's always an eye-opening experience when they actually realize how much money they're spending on some stuff that you know they, they 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 didn't realize. So you providing the business the tools, as well as giving finance the tools. And in fact, you can just give it to finance and say, hey, you're trying to do all this reporting stuff and not just reporting by GL, but now you can report it out by contract and by by spend category. I mean, that's kind of where procurement plugs in, you know, naturally. But that you're really enabling everybody to give them new tools and capabilities to manage this better. And I think that's a good way to create a win-win is to kind of, you know, kind of give everybody a little, uh, a little gift here with this, with this new capability. 
Here's a question. How do you resolve the very different interpretation and in view on internal expense data in finance and accounting terms versus spend data in procurement terms? Because finance doesn't think in terms of addressable spend. Yep. So that's a good point. So um, one of the, if you uh, read uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Michael Lamoureux, he has a um, he has a spend visibility guide that he's written, and uh, it's 175 some some pages, and he really spends a lot of time really getting to this, and it's, and it's absolutely people have different philosophical positions on what granularity you want to be able to tick and tie to the to the numbers because finance is going to have its view around reporting periods and accruals and things that it's doing um, uh, and encumbrances and all sorts of, you know, kind of things that can tweak the numbers a bit. I think the, the, the biggest thing that procurement needs to do is to make sure that when you're mapping to overall expenditures um, that you have a good definition of what is, um, you know, total, total cash dispersed versus what is, quote, addressable. And in that, I would look look to the uh, the benchmarks that are out there from Carney and Hackett and whatever. And this is a pretty well accepted definition on addressable spend, which is basically taking out charitable contributions, transfer pricing. You know, there are things that are pretty well accepted around kind of taking out. After that, it's you know it's pretty uh, you know tax payments. After that, it is all of the rest is addressable. Now, whether you can address it or not is, um, you know, that's another question. And that's kind of classic kind of spend influence. But you have to be able to have those definitions. And if you're looking for guidance on that, you know, um, there, um, you know, just look to some of those uh, benchmarks for providing some of the guidance, um, providing some of the guidance there. But there's always going to be some wrangling you got to do about reconciling disbursements going out the door to suppliers versus some of the other ways to view the data, like through the lens of the financial statements, et cetera. Maybe we can take one more. Yeah. I know we're over, guys. Yeah. If you need to leave, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I see a podcast in our future. I definitely do because there's, there's a lot here to talk about. Um, how about a question from Chris? Does your procurement ROI typically only include hard cost value, or does it also include cost avoidance, DPO demand, et cetera? Yeah, there's... Um, all of the benchmarks that are out there that you can get from CAPS and Carney and Hackett and, you know, lo- lots of places, the, pro- the, the procurement R- ROI tends to be the, um, tends to be the, and, and you know what, it, and it really it doesn't matter how you do it within your organization because those groups have the data on both hard cost savings as well as avoidance. And there's some variation in how they look at avoidance and, other strategic um, benefits. In general, uh, my preference is you look at it and you include avoidance and you get it and you have the discussion around avoidance because avoidance, you might not want to use that word, but actually, you know, say, look, this is ultimately, this is a future cost, you know, a future cost savings that it's going to ultimately show up as a PPV. It's just the fact that we're getting ahead of it and we're protecting the business so that we're not going to be able to get an unfavorable PPV in two or three um, years. So having some of the discussions with the CFR on the things that go into cost avoidance are useful to have. Now, if you want to start with hard ROI in terms of just the hard cost savings, um, that's fine, you know, and that's a good place to start. But the good news is that with all the benchmarks that are out there, you can compare yourself on both the hard ROI as well as kind of the, the softer ROI that includes the avoidance. But I, I think it's you, you need to get the avoidance discussion in there, even though finance may be like, what the hell is avoidance? You, you have to kind of translate that <laughs> for them. So <laughs> I guess there's one word for that risk. <laughs> how do you how do you how do you measure that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, we, we still have more than 75% of our attendees on the line, guys. So um, if you don't mind taking one more question, um, then we can wrap up. Now, um, this one is, how does the savings derived by procurement organizations, how can that ensure it has a direct impact on the balance sheet and not just the Donald Duck money as claimed by business? Right. Um, <laughs> Donald Duck mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, first of all, it's the biggest thing is impact on certainly on the income statement and making sure 
that those are that that's that that's getting um, booked, and that is really if, if you, you it's really you're doing this really with finance and making sure that that those budgets are going to go ahead and get reduced. Now there is people have different approaches. You know you can if you want behind the scenes you know be informing. Uh, finance, you know, on what amount should be coming out of the budgets and hope the business doesn't find out. But really, that game, you know, you can only play for so long. You do want to ultimately have it above board, but you can, it's not, it's not just fake money because ultimately finance is going to be responsible and will go ahead and reduce the budgets. The bigger issue, though, is now with the business who's saying, all right, um, you're, you're, you're taking the money away, but did the economic savings and the value actually get created and not just be, and if it was really funny money and it really, and the, and, uh, you know, you negotiated these great savings and you never used the contract and you never realized them, absolutely, then it would be funny money. And that's where I would say you have to have the control system, if you will, the monitoring that is going to let you see the spend in that category against those contracts with those preferred suppliers and making sure that spend is not going um, to anybody else, and also make sure that you get your P-card spend and T&E spend and that that's getting included in this because that's money going out the door as well. And if you don't include that um, that uh, cash, then that is maverick spending that you're not seeing. So really good spend analysis means including all disbursements that are out there, not just you know the, the basic uh, AP history that, that, that you're getting. Thanks, Pierre. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and for having such great questions and sticking around so that we would have an opportunity to get through as many as possible. And for those that I wasn't able to address, we'll be sure to follow up via email. And um, that's all the time we have. We've certainly ran over. I want to thank again Pierre and Constantine. So on behalf of Sin Matters and our sponsor today, Determine, thank you for taking the time to participate in today's discussion. We appreciate your time, and we hope we've covered some valuable points for you to take back to your procurement and finance teams and consider as you continue to improve your approach to spend. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks, Bye. thanks everyone. Thanks, Constantine. Thank you. Bye-bye.